Hello and welcome to today's lesson looking at Newton's Law of Gravitation which is found in the Gravitational Fields topic of A-Level Physics in the AQA module. So in today's lesson we're going to look at what Newton's Law of Gravitation is and look at how to calculate the gravitational force between massive objects. So if we're successful and we learn in today's lesson we can define what a gravitational field is, calculate the gravitational force of attraction between two objects, and describe how the gravitational attraction varies with distance, which falls into the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification. So it's on Newton's laws of the gravitational field topic, which is found in paper 2 of AQA A-level physics. Now, a field is a very important concept to define in the universe. Now, a field is a region in the universe where an object placed inside of it can experience a non-contact force due to its position in the field. Now, the properties of the field are given by the virtual particles of the force interaction, and the objects must contain a certain property to experience a non-contact force when inside the field. Now, in gravitational fields, this property is mass. So, but in electrical fields, this property is charge. Now, what do we know about gravitational fields? Well, gravitational fields act on objects with mass, they extend out to infinity, they exert weak forces, and they're always attracted. Now, any field in physics can be described with four main properties, and these definitions of these properties are consistent amongst the different fields. So, learning these definitions is integral to understanding the physics of any field. Gravitational, electrical, magnetic. The first property is the force law, which details the force exerted between two objects inside the field, and is usually named after the famous scientist who worked in this particular area. Property two, which is the field strength, which details the force exerted on one object per unit property of the field due to the object being in the field and this is due to the field produced in the universe so for example the gravitational field strength is the force per unit mass experienced by an object inside a gravitational field the third property is the potential which details the energy stored in one object per unit property of the field due to the object being in the field, which again is due to the field produced in the universe. So, for example, gravitational potential is the energy per unit mass experienced by an object inside a gravitational field. And finally, property 4, the potential difference, which details the work done moving an object per unit property of the field from one point in the field to another point in the field. So, for example, gravitational potential difference is the work done per unit mass experienced by an object moving from one point in the field to another point in the field. And then, technically, the absolute potential difference details the work done moving an object per unit property of the field from outside the field defines infinity to a point in the field. So, the absolute gravitational potential difference is the work done per unit mass experienced by an object moving from outside the field to a point in the field. Now, if we look at the following pictures, it shows us that some forces, such as the magnetic force, the electrical force, the gravitational force, can be non-contact. This means the objects do not have to be touching each other to exert a force on each other. So, for example, the Earth and the Sun are not touching, yet there's a gravitational force between them, this shows us that gravitation is a non-contact force. However, some objects do need objects, so some forces do need objects to be in contact with each other to exist, which we call contact forces. So examples include friction, reaction force, tension. So in this example, the ball and the surface are rubbing against each other. The bumps in each of the surfaces prevent the smooth movement, so this contact provides the frictional force. In this situation, the surface is providing an upwards force on the ball to stop the ball falling through the surface and hitting the ground. This contact between the object and the surface provides the reaction force. In this situation, the ball is pulling down on the cable. This causes the cable to stretch out. So this contact provides the tension or tensile force. So all forces between objects are either contact forces, which are forces produced when due to objects physically touching, such as friction, air resistance, tension, and the normal force, whilst non-contact forces 
are forces produced when objects can be physically separated. So examples of this include the gravitational force, the electrostatic force, and the magnetic force. Now this is a very important idea, because objects can exert non-contact forces by transmitting a field in space. A field is just a region of space where a body can feel a force. So for example, the Earth's gravitational field is the region of space where you can experience the Earth's gravitational force. And we represent fields with the concept of field lines. So examples of field lines can include gravitational fields. Now the strength of a field is given by its field density. How many field lines are found in an area? In a field, you tend to find that the closer you are to an object, the denser the field lines, the stronger the non-contact force. So in this situation, the closer you are to Earth, the stronger the effect of gravity. So it's very important to note that the density of the field lines indicates the gravitational field strength. So in this particular example, J has a lower density of field lines, so a smaller gravitational field strength, whilst K has a higher density of field lines, so there's a larger gravitational field strength. Now, it tends to be in situations like this, a variation in gravitational field strength on a surface of a planet is likely caused by the material varying in density for the same volume, because the greater the density of material for the same volume, the greater the mass that's present, so the greater the gravitational field produced. So in essence, how do we get this field pattern? Well, under the surface of K, the rocks are denser than the rocks under the surface of J. Now, it's very important that we, are, we draw our field lines with a certain set of rules. So we draw our gravitational field lines as straight lines from the object with arrows on them showing their direction. Now, it's very important to note that any massive object, any object with mass inside a gravitational field will experience an attractive gravitational force. The objects do not have to be touching to have this force exerted on them. Now, gravity is a universal attractive force acting between all matter. All massive objects will experience a gravitational force with any other massive object in the universe. Now, different massive objects can have interacting field lines, but they can never overlap. Field lines from massive objects can join up, but they cannot cross. So here is an example of two gravitational fields interacting. Now, interestingly, if you look in the middle, you'll see that there are no field lines. Now, the reason for that is that at that particular point of space, the resulting gravitational field is zero, as the two fields from the objects are cancelling each other out as they're exerting forces in opposite directions. Because M1 is acting towards M1, and M2 is acting towards M2, so in between the two, an object place there will be pulled one way and the other way, so they will cancel out and you will get no overall gravitational force. Now, it's important to note that for a gravitational field, the field line should always be pointed towards the massive object. That's very important because the field lines show the movement of a test mass in the field if it was placed at this point. So any test mass would always move towards the object produced in the gravitational field because gravity is always attractive. Now, there are two types of gravitational field shape you can get. You can get a radial field and you can get a uniform field. Now, we tend to find that a radial field is produced by any particle, but a uniform field is a field which is assumed to have the pattern when moving close to a massive object because it's difficult to observe a curvature over small distances of a massive object. So if you moved five metres above the surface of the Earth, you wouldn't notice the curvature of the radial field lines, even though they are present, so we just assume it's uniform. But what's the difference between these two types of gravitational field? Well, in a radial field and a uniform field, the gravitational field lines both point in the direction a massive object would take, towards the object produced in the gravitational field, because gravity is always attractive. We also know that with a radial field, the gravitational field strength decreases with distance in the field because the field lines are spreading out the further you are from the object producing the field. But in a uniform field, the gravitational field strength is constant throughout because the density of the field lines is unchanged. Because remember, the field lines indicate the movement of a massive object placed in the field. Now, Newton actually measured the gravitational force between two massive objects, and he deduced 
that the magnitude of this gravitational force between masses m1 and m2 was the following. It was proportional to the product of m1 and m2, it was inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, and the force was always attractive, which led us to form Newton's law of gravitation, which is the idea that we've got a relationship of force is directly proportional to 1 over r squared. So this, when the separation is double, the force exerted decreases by a factor of 4, 2 squared. Now, the reason for why this happens is the same in both gravitational and electrical fields. They both follow the inverse square law when considering the force between two objects. Now, this occurs as both gravitational fields and electrical fields work by the same underlying mechanism. Now, they both work because the field line spread out is spheres. So this gives us a relationship of 1 over r squared due to the surface area formula of a sphere. Because we, we think of it as the following. Say you've got a mass, and then that mass is produced in a gravitational field. Well, as the mass has produced this field, the further we get away from the mass, the larger the, gravi the spherical gravitational field, and we know that the greater the distance from the mass, the larger this gravitational spherical field. Now we know the equation for the surface area is 4 pi r squared, and because the gravitational field lines are spread out over a greater area, which increases by a factor of r squared, this gives us our inverse square relation. Now interestingly, just to note, there are two major differences between the gravitational field and the electrical field. And the first one is the field strength because they're represented by different constants, and the electrical fields are a lot stronger than gravitational fields. And secondly, the electrical field can be attractive or repulsive, but the gravitational field can only ever be attractive. Now, what happened is Newton worked out a law of gravitation, then you've got to state the relationships and the equation. So you've got to be aware that Newton's law of gravitation indicates that the gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses and is inversely proportional to the square of the distances between them. But we know Newton's law of gravitation is equal to F is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared, which shows us our relationship between F and 1 over r squared. Now what does this mean? It implies that the gravitational fields are radial, which is the case on a large scale for any gravitational field. Now in this particular equation, g is the universal gravitational constant, which is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Now, it's interesting to note that this value is very, very small, which is why gravitational forces can only be easily observed from very massive objects like stars and planets, and not from smaller massive objects like humans or chairs or tables. Now, this constant is much smaller than the constant we have for the electrical field equations, which is why the gravitational force is generally much weaker than the electrical force. Now, F in this particular equation is the attractive gravitational force acting on each object. So each object in this situation experiences the same size of gravitational force. And M1 and M2 are the masses of the two objects which are having a gravitational attraction between them. Now just to clarify as well, R is the separation between the two massive objects. And we always measure that from the centre of masses of the objects not the surfaces of the objects. We measure it from where we assume the mass is, which is the centre of mass, which tends to be the centre of the sphere. Now, remember what we said before. The force produced in this situation is the same for both objects. So they'll have a resultant force acting on them, which will cause the objects to accelerate towards each other, because there's an attractive resultant force acting on both objects. However, the acceleration experienced by each object may be different as it as it's based on the mass of the object as well, because it also depends upon that. Because, you know, acceleration is equal to force over mass, which is Newton's second law of motion. So whilst the force is the same for each object, the masses might be different, 
as a result given a different acceleration. Now, for this particular equation, we're assuming three ideas. Assumption one, we assume the masses are point masses. We don't consider the volume of the sphere. Number two, we assume these objects have a uniform density. And assumption three, we assume there's a vacuum between the objects. There's nothing hindering this field from being projected. Now, let's just recap what we've learned. So, Newton measured the gravitational force between two massive objects. This non-contact force is produced as their gravitational fields interact with each other. Both objects experience the same force in this concept, and this occurs as both massive objects are inside a gravitational field. Now, both objects have a resultant force which acts, them, which acts them to cause them to accelerate. However, the size of the acceleration can be calculated from Newton's laws of motion. Acceleration is equal to resultant force over mass. So whilst they might have the same resultant force acting upon them, the masses of the objects might be different, producing a different size acceleration. Now, we can actually calculate a value from Newton's laws equation. So let's look at the following equation. The distance between, uh, from the center of the sun to the center of the earth is 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. The mass of the sun is 2.0 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, and the mass of the earth is 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Calculate the force of gravitational attraction between the sun and the earth. Well, step one, identify that the force between the two objects is calculated with Newton's law of gravitation, which makes sense from the question. So we write down F equals G M1 M2 over R squared. Step two, identify the two masses and the separation between the two centers of mass, not the surfaces, from the question and place these into the equation, which we've done so in the question. Then step three, we um, calculate the force exerted. Now remember, this R term in the equation is squared. People commonly forget to do that in examination questions. And we get an answer of 3.6 times 10 to the 22 newtons. Now remember to give your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures and with the correct units. And we've done that because it's two sig big in the question, so we've done two sig big in the answer, and we've given the units of, of newtons because it's a force. Now, also remember that this is the force exerted on both objects in the situation. So the sun and the earth both experience this force. If you want to think of it, uh, the earth would experience a much higher acceleration because its mass is a lot smaller than the sun's. So it would work through like that. Now, Let's just summarise what we've learned in today's lesson. Gravity is a universal attractive force acting between all matter, and the magnitude of the force between point masses is F equals G M1 M2 over R squared, where G is the gravitational constant. So if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we can define what a gravitational field is, calculate the gravitational force of attraction between two objects, and describe how gravitational attraction varies with distance. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson on what gravitational fields are and Newton's laws of attraction. Have a lovely day.